You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks. I'm Mark Newbold, and joining me today on the 117th episode of Making Tracks is a man who Time Out magazine was described as the second best Mark since the skid. Mark, how are you doing? Thank you very much for that. Time Magazine, they, they know exactly what we're talking about. So, they do. how are you, buddy? How's yeah. things? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, it's been, a well, another week that's flown by like crazy. Plus, we've had snow, yeah. which has been quite interesting. I was not expecting that the other day. Woke up looking out the window expecting rain. I certainly expected rain. I did not expect a winter wonderland that I got when I opened up the blinds. How about you? What have you been up to? I was at Reading Comic Con yesterday and... Reading. We assume. I mean, Wales Comic Con's in Telford, so we can never assume. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it could have. It could have actually been anywhere in Berkshire, and we probably would have called it Reading Comic Con. <laughs> but yeah, Reading Comic Con, put on by Creed Conventions. I was there with the Rebel Legion, and we had a good time. It was cold. We had uh, rain, snow, and sleet throughout the day, so that put a bit of a, a dampener on on things and probably attendance a little bit. But it was generally busy, and you know, I picked up a few things. I met Richard Oldfield, who played Hobby in The Empire Strikes Back. Had a bit of a nice chat one. with him, just kind of wandered around. I was actually my Jedi yesterday, which is ironic, you know, but what, one of the times there was a, an actual pilot from Star Wars there signing and I'm in the wrong costume. But hey-ho, <laughs> shows I don't do my research. The pictures look great, so don't worry, but yeah. It's always the way. We were at Red, uh, we were at Wales last week, and there was like X-wing pilots and and snow speeder pilots there. And yeah, hey, these things happen. I'm good. We went. I said, we. I said the royal. We. It was myself, Carl from Desert Planet Discs, and his daughter Marianne, and Claire from Planet Layer, and Martin Kilo from Hashtag Cantina, and Star Wars Spins, and the Zoovium. Uh, we all went to the Symphony Hall in Birmingham after having a lovely meal at a place called the Indian Brewery in Birmingham near the Jewelry Quarter and uh, saw Jedi thrown up on the big screen with a live orchestra, uh, the Novello Orchestra that had done some of these tours before. And yeah, it was fantastic. And the only complaint and the only grumble I'd got was there was no merch. Oh, really? Which was really weird. Yeah, because yeah, when they did Star Wars, I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, they did Star Wars at the uh, Albert Hall and uh, I missed Empire, sadly, but... I know for Empire as well as Star Wars, there was there was merch, T-shirts and, and brochures and such. Absolutely nothing here. But I understand they are doing Jedi at the Albert Hall next year. So I might just see if I can sneak a ticket for that and go down just on the off chance that there is a, some merch there. But if not, it means you're seeing Jedi again on the big screen. So it was a really good night. Really good night. Wicked. That was the performance that was basically delayed, wasn't it, from was it 20, 2020? Uh, because of a pandemic yeah, yeah so and you're yeah. lucky because you get to see it i've got tickets for royal albert hall and that's been delayed until september next year so it's even longer yes. wait so the momentum's lost a little bit hasn't it because they were doing like star wars and we did empire within a fairly kind mm-hmm. of you know shorter time span and there's been a bit of a wait for jedi but as long as i get to see it that's the main thing because there's something good isn't there about watching star yeah. wars with an actual live orchestra it kind of makes everything kind of come alive that little bit more than a normal so you know it's I'm really looking forward to when I finally can see it. Yes, it was fantastic, as as it always is. And, and it's a popular thing now. They did it, one of the first ones I remember hearing was Lord of the Rings did it years ago at the Albert Hall, years and years and years ago. Uh, and I've seen Raiders, and, and they did Beauty and the Beast, which was fantastic. But the Star Wars ones are a bit special. Oh, I think I saw Star Trek Beyond as well with an orchestra, which was really cool. Mm. But yeah, um, and, and I know in the States, I think they've either, I don't think they've actually got to it being performed yet, but they've certainly announced it. They're doing Force Awakens, which again will be great. That score with a, you know, with a full orchestra plot watching that film would be brilliant. But if they don't do the prequels, if we don't get to see Phantom Menace with a live orchestra, I will riot. Yeah. I'm saying it now. That score is, is my, in my top five all-time movie scores, Phantom Menace. So that needs to happen. You mentioned you picked up a couple of things at Reading. What did you get? I got Richard Oldfield's autograph, got a couple of Funko Pops. And I tell you what, I was after the Qui-Gon Jinn Amazon exclusive Funko Pop during okay. uh, MCM Birmingham and uh, London. And it was 40 quid, which was kind of like... I remember you saying. Yeah, a little bit yeah. steep. Pretty sure I bought it from a vendor who happened to be at London M- MCM, but I bought it yesterday at, at Red and Comic Con. Paid 25 quid. 
So something to be said there for be smaller conventions. <laughs> biding your time. Oh, and biding your time, exactly, <laughs> a bit of patience, yeah. yeah. And I and, uh, got home and uh, lovely to be surprised, uh, Star Action Figures, they sent me a uh, Stormtrooper, one of the new retro prototype Stormtroopers. And it's funny because I was talking to my good mate, Phil Parker yesterday and he had picked yeah. up three and I go oh well you know that's really lucky because he had three of all different coloured ones and I thought that was a yeah. full set and then we saw a photo online and there was actually four of them so I was just like oh no gutted so yeah so I'm again I'm kind of <laughs> glad I've only got like the one because when you get one it's kind of like that's good enough but when you end up getting two or three it's like you kind of feel like you need yeah. to kind of finish your set so yeah how about you you pick anything up recently no not really it's been a quiet week i've had a couple of books come through that i need to review i've got some stars year by year i recently reviewed battles that changed the galaxy which is up on the site already which i really enjoyed and i want to have a proper even deeper read of that because there was loads of cool little nuggets in that one outside of that no nothing this week really that i can that leaps to mind i think it's been a fairly quiet week probably not a bad thing with christmas coming up yeah my girlfriend did actually pick me up a couple of uh, lovely star wars ornaments i do try and pick up one or two each year and she picked up a kind of grogu kind of like a bronzed kind of grogu effect in his little bassinet which will hang on the um nice. the tree and uh actually an- another mandalorian one got like mando on a sweet bike with grogu in his little satchel so got a couple of those so extra extra tat for the tree Hi, this is Guy Henry, and you're listening to Fanther Tracks. Enjoy. So what's been going on in the land of Star Wars news then this week? It's been a busy week. We've had a new issue with Empire magazine that seems to have thrown out loads of cool little nuggets. One of those was Dave Filoni talking about the writing of Ahsoka and how important it is that now he's getting to sort of story elements that he's wanted to write about for a long time. He's finding it quite thrilling but startling, as he says. It's kind of startling when he's sitting there and now you have to do it. So so he's thought of Adventures for Ahsoka and I think life has moved on. He's moved beyond animation with the character. Now she's into live action with Rosario Dawson and it's happening and I don't think it's lost on him. What did you make of what Filoni said? He seems very genuinely excited about it. Yeah, Ahsoka. It's the character that he and George Lucas kind of created really together. It's, you know, she is his character, the one that I think he's championed above all, all others. And so you could imagine, even in, back in probably those early kind of concept days with George and Matt, I'm sure he thought, you know, where would I like to take Ahsoka in the bigger picture at the end of yeah. everything? Where where would I like to take her? What adventures would I like to see her be a part of? So I'm sure he's had some burning ideas for a long time. And as he, you know, as we've seen with Mandalorian, you know, they're not shy of introducing expanded universe elements. And obviously we got that one line, where is Grand Animal Thrawn, from the episode of the Mandalorian that Ahsoka was in. So we get a pretty good idea at least we think we get a good idea of you know her main motivation for probably this series so yeah it's going to be fantastic to see where he actually puts her on that she's still a bit of a blank canvas when it comes to live action mandoverse kind of tv you know we've only seen her in one episode so times we moved on from the last time we saw her in star wars rebels yeah, there's yeah. all that you know back story they could delve into and obviously seeing where you know maybe what pivotal events have happened around the galactic civil war which may have again shaped where she's wanted to kind of like you know focus her attentions going forward so because of the fact that they announced all these series last year and it's been bubbling under the surface you know our focus has been on andor and kenobi and book of boba fett this year but ahsoka's that one that's kind of just every now and again you kind of catch a whiff don't you of something and you kind of go oh i wonder what's going to happen and you know you, you start thinking about what's going to be treated to what would you like to see in particular? What do you reckon Dave's looking at doing with her? I think it's a weird one for Filoni because, like, you you just mentioned Rebels, which was really pertinent because I think even... When did Rebels finish? What, 2017, 2018, yeah. whatever it was? Not that long ago, really. Mandalorian would have been announced, and, and they were clearly working on it, you know, a while back, but no way would Filoni then have known quite where it was going to go. I know they probably had season two written before season one was filmed and all that malarkey, but... When he came up with Rebels, which would have been far in advance of when the episode came out, if that makes any sense, he wouldn't have known where it was going to go. So he probably knew that he wanted to do something with Ahsoka. And there was an end game, not an end game, but, you know, a point, a, a big plot point for her to be a part of. But as he says in here, it's a great lesson for me on how, when you have other creatives like John Favreau, they can help lend such dimension and depth to what you're doing. So basically he's thinking, well, Favreau's come up with this Grogu Mando line of Star Wars and Filoni's got his story threads that have rolled out from Rebels, which is obviously before Star Wars, all the way up to six years after Jedi, which is where Mando is. And now Filoni can pick up the character and do what he wanted to do with Ahsoka. 
But alongside that, you've got what Favreau's done with Mando, and they've already overlapped in the Jedi episode, which I believe came out a year ago this week, so that's kind of yeah, that's <laughs> relevant. Right. Mm-hmm. All these things kind of contrive to add even more layers to what he wants to do with Ahsoka. As an outsider, you'd look at it and you'd go, well, obviously, Mando and Grogu are the primary characters. If you're an outsider coming into Star Wars and they're the ones you see, it to, to an outsider coming into Star Wars who's watched The Mandalorian, it's this new Star Wars thing on Disney+. Plus. To them, Ahsoka is the guest star in that episode, and it's like, oh, she's been in comics and books and cartoons before, has she? Okay, I don't really know much about her, but she was kind of cool. So she's the interloper in this, if you like, to us who've been watching it from the start since we watched Clone Wars movie back in 2008. It's like, whoa, this is John Lennon turning up at an Elton John concert sort of level of guest star, isn't it? We know there's a lot more behind this character, so it works on multiple levels. So for Filoni and Favreau to have all these characters and to have to balance and make sure that what Filoni was planning is satisfied and what Favreau thinks needs to happen is also satisfied, it kind of makes you look at that scenario, and I don't want to get political, but it's coming to me as I'm saying it, and then look at the sequel trilogy and think, why couldn't they have thought things through to that degree when they were doing the sequel trilogy? Because it feels here like everything is very considered. It feels like they've really thought this through and they're accommodating things and they're massaging things to make it work. Mm-hmm. Does that yeah. make any that sense? It sense. feels yeah. that, you know, there was a story process that was started out quite a few years ago, but it wouldn't surprise me if he he was always thinking X amount of steps ahead of like, well, I'd like it to be in this situation. I'd like it to be in that one. She doesn't just feel like a character you'd throw in to pepper up a storyline. There's always a point for Ahsoka being there and doing things. And this feels like that's just part of that. So... I don't know what I'm going to see her do. I think we'd all like to see her and Sabine team. We talked about the rumours last week. And if Ezra comes into it, how exciting and interesting would that be? Luke setting up his Jedi Academy, so it kind of folds into that sequel trilogy Mm -hmm. thought process of they've got to start setting these... They haven't got to, but you'd think they would start setting these things up to fill in that, that massive gap. So great potential here. Really great potential. Hello, I'm Dennis Lawson, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. Last week at Wales Comic Con, we were fortunate enough to speak to loads of great guests. Some were on last week's episode, some were on episodes coming up over the next few weeks. But this week, we wanted to let you listen to my little chat. And it was only brief, it was about four minutes, but a chat with Robert Watts, producer of the Star Wars trilogy, Indiana Jones trilogy, Roger Rabbit, all sorts of stuff. Uh, He's probably, by his own admission, coming too near to the end of his convention days. Uh, Don't think he'll be doing too many more. Hasn't completely closed the lid on doing shows in the future, but uh, they will be limited and probably more local to where he lives down in the southeast. So if you're in that part of the world and you get the chance to see him, take it up because he's a legend. But we did manage to grab just a few minutes. So this is myself and Robert Watts just having a brief chat at last week's Wales Comic Con. So we're here at Wales Comic Con in Telford. I love that Wales Comic Con's in Telford. And I'm sat next to Robert Watts. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. How's life treating you? Because it's been weird for everybody the last couple of years, hasn't it? It has been weird for everybody, and I still find it strange that those films that I did so many years ago are still here, and I, I, I go to events like this, and I'm still treated like a VIP, and it's amazing. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, you look at these films now, and there's great films made today, and let's not get it wrong, but, but the films that you guys made back then, the craft and the care and the attention to detail, do you think that's what stood them up to last so long? I think so. And, of course, they're based on very good scripts, yeah. and that is always the key to any film, to have a first-class script that you are filming, um, and that, of course, is the storyline. And that carries the event. And uh, I think, well, it still surprises me to go to an event like this and see all these people dressed up in Star Wars costumes. (laughs) When those films came out, were you ever conscious? Because there was a heck of a run for Spielberg and for Lucas at that time. So you've done your Star Wars bits, now you get onto doing indie stuff. Were you aware that you were making significant films? Yes and no. You are never entirely aware that you're going to have something that's going to last as long as these have. Because look at me now, I'm sitting here uh, as a VIP at this convention and made these films years ago. 
uh, no, they're brilliant films. Lucas, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are brilliant filmmakers. Steven is a brilliant director. I mean, we had all the elements going for us. And good stories, good scripts, and brilliant people surrounding you. You say about good stories, you've always had good stories. Do you still enjoy coming out to events like this and, and telling some of those stories and mixing it up with people? Yes, I do, actually, because it's like going back through time, in a sense, and I go back to an era that I was once part of and that's gone, and yet it comes back again uh, at these kind of events. Brilliant. Well, I can see you've got a queue of people, so I'll leave you to it. It's always good to catch up with you. Thank you very much indeed, and it's good to see you. This was issue of Empire Magazine. Loads of pictures, loads of info. We're talking about a lot of it on this week's episode, but one of the images that landed was a very, very cool image of Timura Morrison, obviously as Boba Fett, and Ming Na Wen in the background with a great big hulking Gamorrean guard talking to an unnamed, as yet, Twi'lek character played by Jennifer Beals. Don't know what they're talking about. Just to think, what are the possibilities? What do you think? Do you think she's a peripheral character? Do you think she's a main character? She's given off main character vibes to me. What do you think the story could be? I mean, really, we know literally nothing other than this photograph, do we? I wonder, and I wonder if I'm reading too much into this, you've got Fett on one side, Jennifer Beals' character on the other side framed, and then you've got Fennec in the middle. And I wonder if mm. that is a compositional choice because that's maybe just happenstance of whether or not there's actually more narrative there, maybe, I don't know, to do with Fennec's character and maybe how she's bridging the gap between Fett and the rest of the underworld because of the fact that Jennifer Bill has been in the main teaser trailer we got and there was a short 30-second one that dropped earlier on, I think, this week as well. She was yeah. featured in that. Again, it's the same shot. It seems like there's a bit of focus on her, so I wonder if maybe she is a recurring character in this series. She's clearly well kitted out in terms of like she looks fairly affluent, so maybe yeah, she's a facilitator of some description anyway. But the other thing I I like in this photo is the Gamoran guard, and I just wonder have all the Gamoran guards kind of gone on a diet since Return of the Jedi, or or did Jabba <laughs> just basically um, have like the market share of all the overweight rejected Gamma guards who kind of maybe failed at uh, wrestling or all the Gamorrean guards we've seen since Mandalorian kind of was released, they all seem to be a little bit more svelte than they used to be. Yeah, they do look more muscular and a bit more intense. I mean, uh, I'd say, obviously, last night, I mentioned it earlier, we went to see Jedi at Symphony Hall and it was great to see it again. Gamorreans you see in, in, certainly in season two, Amando, pretty well, the first episode yeah. you saw him fighting in the pit, didn't you? Uh, you know, they looked amazing. They looked fantastic. And it was good to give a twist to that vision or that look of what a, a Gamorrean gold would be. But you're absolutely right. We haven't seen any of the big tubby guys yet. I'll put a piece up on the site. We'll link it in the show notes. Just sort of spitballing where where we could be going with this and what it could mean because there's lots of options. And I think having Fennec and Boba Fett together in this era is interesting because we're watching Bad Batch and we've got Bad Batch Season 2 next year. And, of course, in there we've got Omega. Boba Fett is Alpha. Fennec knows them both, so she's the link between, she's a potential link between these characters if that's the way they want to do it. Got to be careful that we don't have too many characters linking to other characters because you kind of have that in Mandalorian where Ahsoka links to this character, links to that character, you know what I mean? It, you know, it could get a bit convoluted in that sense. But I think with this one, Omega's being introduced in Bad Batch as a character that could have a, an interesting future turn out to be significant beyond what you see her in, the, in that show. Fennec, is she kind of the intermediary between him and the rest of the galaxy? Because he's coming. You see that rain trailer that you just mentioned. You know, you see the, the dining table. You see all the different characters sitting at the table. The Aqualish and all the other characters. You see 8D8, you know, the old torture droids in that shot as well. It's kind of cool because he's saw uh -huh, 99 yeah. in Mando in the bar. You know, you see all these characters in new positions. And Mando's literally mafioso style at the head of the table. And it just made me think of the dining room table in Empire when it's Fett and Vader, you know, as Han and Leia and Chewie and Lando walk in. I love the way, I mean, just going to that trailer briefly, you hear Timura say, I am Boba Fett. Timura in real life says those words with such genuine reverence because he's so obviously as an actor and as a person, he's so proud and, you know, he, he loves being part of that team Boba Fett thing with Jeremy and John Morton and, mm. you know, he's clearly invested in that. But when you hear him say, I'm Boba Fett in character as Boba Fett, it puts a different spin on it. 
And it's great for the audience because we're all like, guys, this is Boba Fett. You know, we kind of know that it's going to get real at some point. It's going to really kick off, you know, dramatically, thematically, from a story point of view. They can't all just sit around the table and look at each other and go, well, hey, here's Boba Fett. Let's just give him an easy ride and just do what he says. That's not going to happen. No. So they're, they're setting all these pieces up. Jennifer Beale's character, I think you, you could be right. I think she's affluent. She's a playmaker. That's the vibe I'm getting from her. Johanna from Planet Leia says it a lot. She's really into the handmaidens. And you look at the handmaidens and you make a, an initial visual assumption that they're just there to help and assist and pour drinks for the queen and all that sort of stuff. And as time moves on, you learn out that they're as lethal as the Emperor's guards ever were. They're like her hitmen, assassin, protector sort of characters. And you, you don't know that from just looking at them. There's a background yeah. to them that you, initially on screen you wouldn't be aware of. You look at the other Twi'leks, the Twi'leks are naturally by nature attractive, and there's lots of different elements. You see Ula first, well, you see Bib Fortuna first, but, you know, you see Ula, you think all male Twi'leks are scumbags like Bib, and then you meet somebody like Cham Syndulla, and you realise, ah, they're not actually. And then you think all female Twi'leks are dancing girls like Ula, and then you meet Hera Syndulla, and you realise they're not, you know what I mean? Mm. So there's lots of different potentials for her character, but I think she's she's a player. That's eye to eye with her. They're having a deep conversation. As much as you can pull anything out of a photograph, that's as much as I can pull out of it. The thing they've got to be careful about, and I'm sure they, they, they're planning this right now and trying to get with schedules, is making sure that, yes, there's enough time in the calendar year to kind of get all these series out in a relatively quick succession. Because when you speak about the Defenders, they all kind of came out fairly quickly in succession. It made it quite easy to kind of like watch them and then jump into the Defenders and watch that, that finale, which was pretty awesome actually at the time. So I'm really excited for this. Let's see where it goes. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. So this month, Empire Magazine is the gift that keeps on giving, and there's more. It's Kathleen Kennedy talking about Obi-Wan Kenobi this time, about how being on set with Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen, seeing them together, watching them get excited, was a bit of a special moment. I will read the quote. This is Kathleen Kennedy. Can't do a Kathleen Kennedy impression. I have tried. The thing that was most exciting was being on the set and watching the two of them get excited. They hadn't seen each other in a long time. I was surprised at how incredibly emotional it was for each of them to find themselves back in these roles and just realising how important Star Wars was to each of them. It was the beginning of their careers. It wasn't, but in a big movie <laughs> blockbuster style it was. Yeah. Obviously, you and had done Train Spot in Shallow Grave, all sorts of stuff, but you get her point. In terms of big, big movie making, I guess it was. So we know they're going to meet on set. We've talked about, often, about Obi-Wan on this show. We've thought about flashbacks. We've thought about what could be happening in the present, you know, 10 years before A New Hope. What do you think? What Do you think that the predominant, element of their fla- of their interactions Anakin and Obi-Wan will be flashbacks to the Clone Wars do you think that them having encounters and clashes we did see some pre-production art not that long ago of Vader and Obi-Wan in the armor fighting in a fiery background so they're kind of they've more than hinted that that's going to happen if that ends up in the show of course what do you think you know the bulk of their interaction will be in the past or in the present I think it will be relatively evenly split because this series ultimately is called Kenobi so I think that with that you've got to deal with him reconciling with his failure of not stopping Anakin even though he totally could have done and just kind of lopped his head off down in the lava pit Mm -hmm. also then the ramifications and the swift effect it's had on the Jedi Order with that decimation and then the turn from the Old Republic to the Galactic Empire so I think it would probably make narrative sense to probably have a bit of both i mean ultimately you don't want to be stuck so much in like flashbacks because otherwise we've basically just got a prequels tv show haven't we true and i tell you what i wonder if they do it in a similar kind of way now this is a bit of a stretch um so you know how in cobra kai every now and again especially in the first couple of series situations would arise and it would flash back to literally the film footage it would either be like a history repeating itself or kind of like the reversal of kind of fortunes and stuff like that and that's quite literal and i suppose that's probably based on the fact that with cobra kai they've only got those films to go on really and they weren't able to kind of recreate younger versions of those people but i wonder also then if yeah there's off-screen stuff that we you know we didn't see in the prequels that will then help to maybe again reinforce their relationship to kind of make whatever is happening in the present of Kenobi 
that bit more emotive. So I think it's mm. going to have to be kind of probably a mixture of both. I kind of feel like really Vader and the fact that they're not shying away from the fact that Vader's in this, that they're going to deliver with Vader probably being the only main bad guy in this series. I reckon it will pretty much heavily focus around their relationship one way or the other. And so hopefully whatever happens in Kenobi, it means that when we next sit down to watch A New Hope, we'll, we'll actually have so much extra baggage that we can maybe read into in their, their final exchange and their final duel. Yeah, I love that thought process. Yeah, and I think one of the great things about the animal, I mean, really, with the Clone Wars and all the animated shows, and obviously Mandalorian, but more the animated shows that are prior to the original trilogy, is learning all these extra little bits of information. When you next see you know, a classic movie or one of the OT, you go, ah, now that puts a different spin on this or that puts exactly. a different spin on yeah. that. And obviously the focus is the Ben and, and Vader clash on the Death Star in A New Hope, in this instance anyway. That's the crux of it. That's the pivotal bit that they've got to reach to. And I find it fascinating that, you know, when George was making Revenge of the Sith, he kind of just at the end of it wanted to sort of set set the stall and lay out enough bits that you go, well, next up it's A New Hope. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now we've had so much between the two trilogies. We've had a season of Bad Batch. We've had all of Rebels. We've had Solo and Rogue One. And there'll certainly be more in that space that Revenge of the Sith never knew would get filled until you got to a new hope. So you see the start of the building of the Death Star and all the different iconography of different things that you go, well, that's the Empire. That, that There it is. Yeah. But with this now, they're even more granular in that it's like, well, we've got this Obi-Wan series that's set 10 years before Star Wars, but we've got to make it match up with, well, two things really. Even though we can't, we know he was massaging the truth when he was telling Luke all the different, certain point of view stuff, but what he tells Luke in the hut and what he's saying to Vader, stroke Anakin, on, in that Death Star conflict and that Death Star battle. So it's really interesting. You're right, it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. And I think increasingly, because we've learnt as an audience to be a little bit more relaxed, I think, I'd like to think, some are really entrenched and won't budge, but I think it helps if you can be a little bit looser and go, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's see if what they do still fits with what is said. Yeah, Because if they do something in this that, that makes no sense when it comes to A New Hope, then it's like, oh, well, that's, they've kind of screwed the pooch on that one. But in this one, you know, if for example, if Ben calls Anakin Darth, mm -hmm. I think before Empire came out, you probably assumed that his name was Darth Vader, not that that was the title, hence getting to Darth Maul, Darth whatever, whatever, whatever. I think you probably thought Darth was the first name and Vader was the surname. And then they decide to go, actually, Darth is a like Sir or whatever, you know, it's a title. So when Ben says it in Star Wars, it seems a bit off. Mm -hmm. But I think now if they do something in Kenobi when he calls him Darth, it's almost like a spitting in his face. It's like almost like an insult. It's a very, not that Ben's an insulting kind of guy. He's too smart for that. He's too subtle for that. You know, he's, he's more refined than that. We know that from Sith. There's things that will happen and, and things that we'll see in this that will really put a, in a good way, a different spin on what happens by the time we get to A New Hope. I'm Brian Herring, BB-8 puppeteer, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. That'll learn you. So a couple of weeks ago, we were both down at Croydon Star Wars Charity Day in, strangely enough, Croydon, and myself and Paul Naylor had the opportunity to go and speak to Aidan Cook. So Aidan worked on all the Star Wars sequel trilogy and Rogue One and Solo and many other films besides. He worked on the Jurassic films. He's done all sorts of stuff. So me and Paul had the chance to take him somewhere quiet which was near the escalator and the kitchen, so it wasn't actually that quiet, and have a chat all about his film career. It was a 20-minute chat. We're going to play the first part in this episode and the second part in a later episode. But here's myself, Paul Naylor, and Aidan Cook talking about Aidan's illustrious career. So, so we're at Croydon. We're currently stood outside the strictly staff-only kitchen yeah. area. We're going to get told <laughs> yeah. off, I know it. Aidan, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. Yeah, really good. What have you been up to lately? Because we haven't called up for a couple of years. Um, so, I can't think, well, well, you know, what we were doing, what we, what we were doing last time we spoke, but... Um, well, I've been... Uh, Jurassic I, was fairly recent. For Jurassic, you, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so Jurassic World, yeah. and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, The Rise of Skywalker yeah. uh, after that. And um, I, I suppose I'm allowed to say that I've been involved in the uh, Cassian Andor series. Excellent. So I can't tell you what I've did on it, no, needless no, no, to no. say. No, no. But uh, I, I suspect you could probably use your imagination in terms of it being a prequel and who was yes. actually in it. So, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so that was a really... Um, 
That was good. It, it kind of all was just about kicking off before COVID. Right. And then literally it all just disappeared. Yeah. And then grad, that, that was around in the spring, you know, March time. Then it started sort of grinding to a start again, yeah. you know, the following sure. January. It's been a very different experience to the films, yeah. partly because of um, you, when you're on the film and you're just, you know, you're one of the CFX department you yeah. know they'll quite often uh, write you're booked for this and then they will place you and use you as they build the scenes yeah. whereas because of covid you could only really be on set with the principal actors if they were pretty much certain that they wanted to use you right. and that gave a very different kind of dynamic to yeah. it so although although it looked like you were gonna oh oh this this is brilliant you'd you'd get your sort of shooting schedule you might only be involved for a couple of days in a month but in order to do that you would tend to have you'd have a covid test two days before you were even allowed through the door of pinewood or you know you would then you then have your costume fittings you then have your rehearsals so so in the end work-wise it's been good in 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 terms of job satisfaction there were i you know there's some there are some it's the general world of CFX, but there's some real nuggets in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and um, uh, those are the things that we kind of really hang on to as as performers, you know. And and so there's a couple of things in there which I'm really really happy about, you know. I so uh, yeah, it had to be that Dunkirk spirit in like we just got to get this done, whatever the process yeah, was to get it. On yeah, film. yeah. I mean, uh, I'm I'm working at the moment on um, I, I don't know. I suppose I'm allowed to say, but I'm um, Disney doing a sort of sequel to Willow. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so, so there's that that series is is being filmed up in Wales at the yeah. moment. Yeah. And originally, uh, it's Neil Scanlon doing uh, all the creature stuff, yeah. and we weren't to be involved. I was involved um, with some of the early um, sort of makeup design and stuff yeah. like that, yeah. and it, it was tried out on me some of the stuff. Sure. But because it was being done in Wales, I think you know the agreement with the Welsh Film Board and government was that they would use. Uh, Welsh talent, right. you know, Welsh techies and stuff like that. So we didn't really have any expectation of working on it. Yeah, it's been sort of. Um, I don't think it's unfair to say you know sort of it's had a lot of problems and yeah. a lot of COVID. They've had a lot of COVID in yeah. Wales, which has, has really kind of upset the schedule. Yeah, and as a consequence, a handful of us have actually been involved. Uh, you know, in with with some of the creatures and with some yeah. of the pu- puppeteering, sort of going forward, and that's actually that's been great as well. You know, and it's 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 the same core team. Yeah. You know, and and they are a, a lovely team to be with and to work with, and uh, and long may it last. You know, yeah. yeah. So next year's got a couple of sort of promising things coming up. You know, I mean, my 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 fortune is sort of tied to Neil's really. Sure. If he chooses to be involved in something, then. I, you know, hopefully he will take me along with him, you know, and find something for me to do on it, you know, and and he's been wonderful so far. So, yeah. uh, so I, you know, I don't think I need to keep my fingers crossed, but I will, <laughs> but, uh, you know, f- for the future so with what, him. Yeah. What got you into the industry in the first place? It was I'm I'm I would describe myself as a jobbing actor, a bit of a character actor, but I've always done a lot of very physical work. Um, I don't know, 20 years ago when my children were small I was doing quite a lot of theatre for children which then led into TV for children and I had a programme on Channel 4 called Rat-a-tat-tat ran for about seven series, uh, seven years you know, and uh, it started off as a sort of more on the education side and it, towards the end it was more of a one man sketch show but still with educational things we actually won a, won a BAFTA and, and stuff like that for it so, um, and, and what happened during that was I, used, I ended up doing a lot of voice stuff for um, uh, you know, for the, they would take a book and animate it, and then I would do. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I, uh, so during this program, Ratatat, they they would uh, one of the things they would do is they would take a published book, they would animate it. I would get to do all the voices. I'll ask sort of Johnny Morris, you know, like that. So, so. Um, so then um, a programme came up and it was just about the time, it was after, after Tweenies, mm-hmm. where the BBC were doing a programme called Fimbles, it was their own yeah, in-house yeah. thing, Very Neil well. was doing the, uh, the work on it, and, um, and I was brought in actually just to do the voice of one of the characters. Mm-hmm. They then, uh, you know, I was playing around, they then allowed me to actually do the voice and operate the animatronic for my own character, which was Fimbo. And that, yeah. So, so, I'm and, sure that, and that, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I'm the, I'm the yellow and green one, yeah. yes. And that kind of got me. Um, that that sort of, I hadn't really been aware of that world, to be honest. The the sort of suits and skins and animatronics and everything. And 
After that, an audition came up for Hellboy 2. And I went along to that audition and got it. And, and, and the, the role I had in it was the... With the it, the, the role I had was the tumor, the one with the tumor baby. Yeah. So basically, it's the two, you know, two-headed shop. Very different from the feminists. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was called the two-headed shopkeeper, you know. And it was, uh, it was incredible work, you know, with Guillermo del Toro, yeah. and he was really lovely to me. Um, treated me incredibly well. Took me out to Los Angeles. Took me out to New York Comic Con, um, and 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 I've bumped into him several times since, and has always remembered me and always been lovely. But but he. Um, it was a, it was an extraordinary challenge because I, I couldn't see, and you know, had the animatronics go in my ear, I could hardly hear. I, I mean, I literally couldn't see, and I had this uh, um, sort of Siamese sort of baby puppet with my arm strapped to my chest, and uh, had like a sort of three, four-way conversation to do. And I remember him saying, you know, you know, I, you know, like, get your eye line, to, eye line to camera. I said. I don't even know where the camera is. Like this, you know, like this. So, he's, so he's, he's, hanging, he's sort of hanging off set like this, sort of twisting my body around, you know, out, out of shot of the camera to sort of it's to get the right... It's process, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the actual... It was... I mean, it was, we're out in Budapest, and he... Um, and we're going to do the show and tell. It was the first time we'd read on the show and tell. And this was, a, bearing in mind, this was a creature that he designed as well, so I think he had a sort of particular affection for it. Yeah. Oh, one of those days. It's all good. So I told you I'd find a good place to stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ding, the train at platform. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So the show and tell. Basically, we were we were in this underground salt mine. Quite the most extraordinary set you've ever yeah. seen this they've been growing mushrooms in this place for 40 years right. it was damp and it was horrible but they built this set into it with false perspectives it was quite incredible the troll market so they took me down they said oh he'll be down in a minute to see you and i'm kind of like this and then the, the uh, ad who was with me said oh i've got to go and do something else they disappeared so i'm like this going i forgot you were oh, i had that no idea couldn't see a thing and it was I, it was the first time probably one of only maybe two times or three times when i've sort of felt a little bit panic rising yeah. anyway i found a sort of seat and sat down in this seat and i was there for eight hours you know and uh, and, and basically i was when they turned up, obviously I didn't know they were coming. I was just sort of singing to myself to try and keep myself sane. Gone, I'd gone, I'd gone somewhere else in my head at this point. Anyway, they really liked. So instead of having me as a two-headed shopkeeper selling selling dope, which is what it was in the script, they had me sat in the barber's chair, which is what I'd found. Yeah. And the other the other creature was in there shaving me when they came in to, so to, to try and trace. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then um, you know that was a long day. And then the day itself, I think it was a. It was about 15, 16 hours without a wee, <laughs> you know, because it takes so long to get into the costume that you can't just come out for lunch, no. you know. So, and uh, it was great, you know. And then there were things. <laughs> I'll tell you one more little anecdote on, on, on that because it was really funny. Because I couldn't see what was going on, he grabs me by the sort of by the throat, the Hellboy, and he's slapping me around the face. And the idea was. Because I couldn't see, and I was having to react to the slaps, and I've got teeth flying out as well. He goes, OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to slap you six times, then we're going to stop, then we're going to start again like this, and we're going to slap you another six. And he kept changing the number of times he was going to slap me. So, so, so he's going to slap you to ten. So I'm going to slap you for ten. OK, now I'm going to slap you for eight. OK, now I'm going to slap you for twelve. Anyway, so I mixed it up, into, or I didn't hear. So I'm going to slap you for... Anyway, we got to eight or whatever it was. He stopped and I kept going. Just everyone was just fall, and then he kind of joined in again. Like, like, <laughs> but it, 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 I think it, it made the um, the, the, the blue blooper made reel, the blue yeah. reel, You know, it was, uh, but everyone was in absolute hysterics. So, uh, no, but but it was it was an extraordinary experience. And then from that, a whole bunch of stuff on Doctor Who happened, yeah. and then. Oddly, I, I did another show for the BBC called Zingzillas as well, uh, which was another animatronic thing. I, I, I was a movement director and the voice and the skin, which is really unusual, you know, to have all, all, yeah, you know, all yeah, sort of three roles. Yeah. And then I was doing the Doctor Who with Paul, actually, a Zygon one with uh, Peter Capaldi. And he said, oh, there's something coming up and uh, uh, it's going to be quite good. And, and we're looking for, you know, we're looking for sort of performers. They want, 
you know, people who are kind of willing to go the extra mile a little bit, you know, sometimes, but pe people, experienced people, and, you know, put your name on the list. And he wouldn't tell me what it was, and I had no idea. And then I, you know, I got a call later to, you know, can you come in, come into Pinewood, we're going to be working on this, you know. And, and that was very early doors, Force Awakens, we worked on, um, there was um, the Happabore, basically, yeah. mm -hmm. and the Lugger Beast, and they were two surprise creatures that were being built to surprise JJ when he come in, when he was coming in to look at all the creature stuff like that. So he came in to look at all the designs, and these two these sort of creatures came sort of lumbering out, and Paul was calling it, and there were five of us in the Hapabore, and at that time it was just plasters out and really light and beautiful. Oh, this yeah. is the best thing I've ever been in. You know, like this. By the time we got to the water hole, it weighed yeah. about eight tons, you know, like... <laughs> I was about sort of six inches shorter after we finished that one, but it was. But we used to come out of it. I mean, you didn't see it in the film, but we, we you know, we, we were walking this stuff around the desert, and we were we they'd be using like you know JCB to move it around when we weren't in it, and then we'd get in it. Okay, JCB away from all, and then. It, and, but we used to come out of it, and the look on people's faces was just like they were awestruck at the way that this thing had coordinated and movement. moved and stuff. Yeah. And they they had a shot of it when the tie fighters come in and start sort of strafing the strafing the mark the uh, trading post. Yes. it starts to move and it starts to go. And so yeah, they had you know the helicopter shots of it moving oh. and 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 Paul was going, keep going, keep going, and we were all inside. <laughs> and there's a, there's a they they they. Done a sort of thing for the making of where they'd put um, GoPros inside it, and uh, it's absolutely hysterical. <laughs> Some of it not releasable. In the next piece brought to you by our episode sponsors, Empire Magazine, Kathleen Kennedy talking on the subject of Rangers of the New Republic. I think we all know that it's probably not going to happen now, but she does talk about it, does say we'd never written any scripts or anything on that. But some of that will figure into future episodes, I'm sure, of Mandalorian. So she hints quite heavily that they'd got plot ideas and thematic ideas, but that they'd not actually written anything. And that really, if she's talking about folding it into future episodes of The Mandalorian, it's not happening as a show. So she pretty much tells us it's not having it happening as a show. First things first, Mark, are you disappointed we're not going to see it? Or are you not surprised that of those billion logos that were thrown out a few a couple of years ago that not all of them are going to come to fruition? I'm not surprised that all of them aren't going to come to fruition. I kind of thought this one would come to fruition, though, just because of the fact that this was, again, one of those series, a bit like Ahsoka, that she talked about being all connected and was going to kind of have a, a single unified kind of conclusion. So you kind of think that maybe they've had to maybe take a, a little bit of a step back and figure how can they make the story elements that was going to be pivotal to this overarching story in Rangers of the New Republic fit into maybe Ahsoka or like Mando season three. And I wonder if that's why that's where they've kind of decided to kind of fit that stuff in. It sounds like they're not going to try and replace Rangers with a, a like for like series. So it might just be that they just have to have a bit of a rethink and, and change the other series to fit in, um, in, you know, essential story elements that they need to kind of keep everything kind of cohesive. But I suppose it's one of those odd things, isn't it? It's like, how can you be disappointed about something that you have absolutely no information about? We we don't know who was going sure. to be attached to it. We assume that Cara Dune and Gina Carano was going to be attached to it. But apart from that, we don't know anything else. We don't know any other actors, any of the directors or the writers or producers or anything. So it's just like this theoretical thing that now isn't going to happen. So I'm sure whatever they do, it will probably just work just as fine. And of course, we probably won't know, you know, on the flip side of that coin, because we like talking about what we don't get or what we haven't got. I'm sure there'll be a lot of fans who will always wonder what we may have had with Rangers of the New Republic. That's very true. It does. It kind of falls into that. Star Trek had it with Phase 2 in the 70s. Though. Yeah. These things that we thought we were going to get and never did. And with Star Wars, we've now got Book of Boba Fett, but sort of six or seven years ago when Rogue One was coming, we, you know, there's the Josh Trank Boba Fett thing. That never happened. So there's always these moments that you wonder, what if, what if? Seeing as now they're very happy mm. to have animation be just as valid and just as much a part of the storyline as live action, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't just go, okay, let's progress Rangers of the New Republic, but let's make it an animated show. That's a good shout. Because you can... Mm. Only could do his Trapper Wolf character, and you know, the other actors that were attached could either have the original actors come back or similar voice yeah. actors. I'm sure somebody could do a Cara Dune type voice because, again, politics aside and Gina Carano not being used aside, which is a shame because I really liked her in that role. 
the character of Cara Dune had so much potential. And I don't know, but my gut tells me that they sort of sat down and were, were a bit deflated that they couldn't progress this as a live action and just thought, oh, well, that's it for Cara Dune sort of thing. Yeah. There must be a workaround. And given that Marvel now with What If, yeah, yeah. which now clearly so tightly folds into what's coming in Spider-Man and it's animated, at, but it's every bit as valid as what we see live action, which is great because it's just the delivery method, isn't it? If there's moments they need to refer to in other Mandoverse shows, just make those segments live action and the rest of it be animated. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? You know, you mentioned flashing back to other moments and using scenes from previous films like Karate Kid style, which mm. is what you know, the first two episodes of Hawkeye, you see that scene from Endgame when he's Ronin and little things like that. They did it kind of with Picard, but not to the same level because they were cutting back from scenes from Next Gen 30 years yeah, ago and exactly. it didn't look quite right. No. But you know what I mean? They, they kind of went there yeah. to a degree. And I think with this, they wanted a live-action flashback scene in an episode of Ahsoka that would be from Rangers of the New Republic. They can't just drop the animated scene in. They could certainly go and make that scene in live-action, mm -hmm. given the technology they've got. Maybe that's a scene that requires Cara Dune. Well, maybe that's where they've hit the bump. But maybe that's where you just start thinking, well, we've got to recast this sucker sometime. Yeah. This character's too good. And everyone talk, we talked about it on the show, about Lucy Lawless being mentioned, and, and she was a little bit reticent and political. It's tricky, but I don't think it's unworkable. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't push this forward as an animated show. Yeah, no, that's a good shout, to be honest. I think, actually, you've kind of hit something, because also that's maybe a way of reinventing or rejuvenating the Cara Dune character without necessarily the focus being on who's playing that character in the same way as you would do if you did a, a live action. Again, it will probably come down to a number of things. It might come down to tone. Maybe they feel, feel that the tone of what Rangers of New Republic was going to be may not necessarily suit an animation. True, very true. Because if we were to have Mandalorian as an animated series, I think it would look and have a very different vibe to it. Although saying that, it, it kind of fits very closely into what we, you know, some of the stuff we got from Star Wars Visions. But that, again, was probably greenlit after the fact of Mandalorian was so well received. But then at the same time, the concept of Rangers of the New Republic, I mean, it, it could so easily be a an animation show because it sounds like, you know, at least when we, I think when we think about it, we think about like Trapper Wolf and that, they're kind of just, you know, they're patrolling the galaxy. So every week's a new planet and they're helping out a village mm. or something or somebody in distress or what have you. And, you know, you've got the overarching big bad in the background of maybe the Imperial Remnant. I think you could move that into some kind of animated show, which might even, you know, have a slightly kind of like Bad Batch kind of skew. So I suppose kind of like teenage kind of audience rather than younger audience or mature audience. But I think it would work. And I think it probably would be a good way to reutilize Cara Dune as a character. Unless, of course, they feel that as a character, Cara Dune, whilst interesting with her backstory, wasn't all that special and maybe you know they could yeah. they could just quite easily just kind of come up with an alternative and maybe they might even have had separate characters who were like oh no we're going to go with Cara Dune but we've got these other characters written or sketched out so we could maybe use them in another series and maybe now that Cara Dune's potentially not going to be in play anymore maybe one of those characters can, can step in and take over whatever it is that yeah. you know she was meant to meant to do going forward. That's a great point because Carson Teva comes to Navarro, gives her the Marshall badge. You know, she, she's already in Marshall working for, for Grief Cargo, but, you know, he gives that New Republic badge and basically says, give us a call. But you've got to think that, that she wouldn't be the only person she's given that badge to. Yeah. You know, if he's a ranger on... I mean, they're just, they use these phrases so loosely and yeah. so almost recklessly. Oh, they're just patrolling the outer rim. <laughs> you know, that's like saying, well, I live in a, a council estate in the middle of London, but you're patrolling the M25. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, no, it doesn't make it's, no sense. The scale is nothing, really, is it? Yeah. Totally. I think you're right. I think that the tone of it, I mean, if Mando was an animated show, it would feel very different. But doing it as live action now, I would imagine for the most part, you do something as animation because it's like, we just can't do this live action. And I think that those days are, are almost gone now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. it's like there's not a lot they can't do. Is you know, you look at the crate dragon in season two, the Marshall episode. It's like that is beyond movie mm. quality. That's, you haven't seen anything like that in movies, let alone in television. It was just insane. It's a shame for you as the CEO of the Rebel Legion in that we've just lost Rogue Squadron as a film, yeah. and now we've lost Rangers of the New Republic as a TV show. You know, a show and a movie that probably would have featured X-wing pilots to quite a hefty yeah, degree. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Which would have been great for you and you guys. It would have been more content, more costumes and more sorts of stuff. So I really hope they find some way, not just of folding the broader plot lines into the other shows, because I think the other shows have got more than enough to deal with, with their own stuff. 
Mm. Just find a home for this somewhere. Yeah. But bearing in mind that Star Wars is so heavily Western influenced, as in like Western genre, spaghetti Westerns and stuff, and Cara Dune's a marshal. Well, how many like Western films basically started with the death of a marshal and a new marshal takes over? That's a great point. So you don't necessarily need to see it, or literally you just see a Cara Dune lookalike just kind of get a blast of bolt in the back or something, fall down dead, cut away, and he's like, we need a new marshal. Who are we going to get? And then introduce new character. Yeah, well, that's that's where you bring Lucy Lawless in as you know, yeah. Dara Dune, Mara, her Mara sister. June. Yeah, <laughs> Mara Dune, oh, perfect. perfect. Mara Dune is this long lost sister she hasn't seen for yeah. like however long. Ev- yeah. Avenging her sister. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, yeah. there's so many ways you could do it because, like I said, it's like don't dwell on the uh, the actor and all the crazy stuff she says or didn't say or whatever. Just focus on the character, and you know, I think ultimately, if if people get too hung strung on the actor, yeah. then I think maybe the character's not actually that strong. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I think Disney probably want to get to the situation and the point where, okay, Mark Hamill's always going to be Luke Skywalker. Yeah. And and, and to, to be fair to Hamill, he's very aware that he's 70 and there's only so much he can do. And he's not overly precious about it, clearly, when he came back as Luke in, in Mando. He was a very much a collaborator. I think, and obviously Carrie's gone and Harrison Ford's probably done his last Star Wars stuff with Rise of Skywalker. Oh, totally, yeah. And probably seems happy with that. But uh, but even with Indy on set filming with dots on his face, so I think he's not overly precious in that sense either. Now it will get to the point where any actor that comes in as, an, as a big-name character, yeah, you're Darth Vader for the next three years until we get somebody else. It's a character that an actor inhabits for a while and then, like James Bond, and then moves on. You know, they can't be too precious. All right, I think this is all we have time for this week's episode of Making Tracks, but we will return for episode 118 next week. So thank you very much for listening. Mark, I guess we don't have any listeners' questions, but if anybody does want to send in a listeners' question, how could they go about doing it? We do have some listeners' questions, and they are building up in a little ball of, of wonderfulness, but we're so busy with all these bits of audio and all the news we're talking about, we haven't had time. But they are there. Keep sending them in. We definitely want more and more and more. But before then, if you want to be part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit Fanthatracks.com or check out the free Fanthatracks app through the App Store or follow us on our mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions by emailing radio at Fanthatracks.com. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Fanthatracks and be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fanthatracks intro, Adam O'Brien for our making tracks opening music and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. And that is me done for this episode. Brilliant. And so on that note, thank you very much again for listening. Until we meet again, you stay safe, look after yourself and everyone everybody else take care and always let the wookie win coming up next on fanta tracks radio it's another episode of making tracks